For those of you who haven't been here before, I can say that St. Francis is the little college of active ideas. Uh, we've, this is one of a whole series of programs we've had. Uh, in recent months, we had a program on the Tea Party just before the November election. Um, in February, we had a program on Is the New York Times Good for Democracy, which was televised on C-SPAN. Um, last week, we had a program on the New York City budget, um, in which I sat there thinking the New York City budget is the equivalent of the tallest building in Topeka. Uh, if you know the New York City budget, you'll get the joke. Um, and tonight, we're, we're talking about the family. Now, in both Catholic social doctrine and small l liberalism, the family is central. And for somewhat similar reasons, the family is understood to be the bastion of society, the grounding on which society stands. In small l liberalism, the stronger the family, the less need there is for big government. Obviously a question of the day. There's another question of the day that, that plays into what uh, Kay has written about. And that's what's called the man session. Have anyone heard of this term in terms of this current downturn? Of the 244,000 jobs created in the last month, 240,000 were for females. What does that mean for the young men that uh, Kay Heinwitz has written about? Now, while many people don't understand this or don't take it all together seriously, Kay Heimwitz has made the study of the family and the socialization of children central to her writing. And I want to I talk about her writing over the past two decades because it's been very influential. Um, she began in the early 90s writing articles uh, for the Manhattan Institute City Journal on just the kind of questions that, that became so important in welfare reform and the kind of questions that, that we, we think about now when we think about how family breakdown affects people's economic chances. She wasn't writing. She was a Park Slope parent raising three kids. Not something it was easy to do as a prolific author. In 2000, she wrote a book called Ready or Not, What Happens When We Treat Small Children as Small Adults. Uh, and if you think this is some imaginative problem. Look at the uh, Saturday Wall Street Jew, uh, Journal review, book review on Susan Sontag, the famous literary critic who treated her son as just that, a small adult. And this, this had a considerable currency in the late 90s. Uh, Kay would have none of it. She wrote, the truth is ch children are ignorant. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> they need to be socialized. The, the academic version I grew up with is uh, the problem with children is that they haven't done the reading. 2004, and between 2000 and 2004, she was writing articles for City Journal that then became part of her books. Uh, 2004 came Liberation's Children. It was about how upper middle class adults tend to focus on developing it, their kids' cognitive skills while neglecting their moral and social development. She called this the mission to prepare them for upward mobility. 2007, Marriage and Cast in America. And you can give this book a one-line summary, which is unfair to the book because it's rich. And that one-line summary is, the best social program is marriage. 2011, the current book, Manning Up, which has created a small sensation. Uh, people I know don't, don't usually get invited to the Today Show, let alone Cosmo Radio, which I like to tease her about. <laughs> the Don Imus Show, which she claimed she wasn't on. Uh, and BBC, and on and on. Uh, Manning Up is about the tension between the alpha girls springing out of the gate into early maturity and careers and the long pre-adulthood of middle and upper middle class adult males who shuffle into their 30s without a life script for themselves. Kind of slackers plus. Uh, Kay will talk for about 20 minutes. And then two of St. Francis' own, Michelle Hirsch and Eric Platt, will comment on her book. They'll exchange, exchange views between themselves, and then I'll turn it over to you. The only thing I ask when I turn it over to you for questions is please ask questions and don't make statements.
Oh, and also, when you, when you stand up to speak, just briefly identify yourself. Dr. Michelle Hirsch is chairperson of the psychology department here at St. Francis and director of assessment. Former director of the Women's Studies Center as well. Her interests lie in health psychology and the intersection between Kay's observations on the slow pace of, of male maturity and the implications, and their implications for the future of men's health. That'll be interesting. I've never seen anything said about that. Uh, Eric Platt has, came to St. Francis recently. This is his first year. A second, I thought you came in here fall of 2010. 2009. 2009. So a second year at St. Francis. He's an early modern uh, historian, uh, specializing in the Dutch Republic and England, two of the founts of modernity and colonial America. His uh, two most recent articles are one for the Dutch academic journal. I won't try to pronounce the name in, uh, in, in Dutch. I once tried to do this in a debate with a, with a Dutch uh, politician and, and made, made myself sound silly. But it's an it's, uh, article for the Dutch academic journal and, uh, and the forward for Brooklyn, B-R-E-U-K-E-L-E-N, Dutch Brooklyn. Voyage to New, New Netherland, published last year by the Brooklyn Historical Society, which is only a few blocks from here. With that, let me give you Kay, Kay Heimwitz, and her new book, Manning Up. Thank you, Fred. Um, Fred is very, very jealous that I went on the Today Show. <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't admit it, but I, what I haven't told him is that he should be expecting a call from Hoda and Kathy Lee any day. <laughs> Um, uh, thank you so much to Chancellor Macchiarola, <laughs> uh, and to Fred, of course, uh, and to the Manhattan Institute. Um, I'm going to try to make my remarks in two sections today. Uh, I'm going to begin by giving you a kind of overview of the book, and then I'd like to spend a little time, if I get there, uh, on the reception to the book because uh, it's been quite uh, interesting. Um, and um, I think that in some ways the reception tells a, a great deal about the culture, in some ways more than, than what the book itself says. So uh, with that in mind, let me, let me begin by telling you the, the origins of the book. It really uh, arose out of three kind of commonplace, ordinary observations that probably many people in this room have made themselves. Uh, one of those observations, and this was uh, largely proud of the fact that I had three children uh, in this age, uh, in the age group of the 20s and early 30s, was that it was taking a lot longer to grow up. Uh, that uh, my own kids um, were um, living a very different kind of life in their 20s than I had. So that was observation number one. Uh, observation number two also very obvious to anybody with eyes, was that women were doing extremely well uh, in schools uh, and in, uh, in this age group as well. Uh, and in some ways seemed very, very put together more so than the boys. The third observation uh, was that, uh, was Adam Sandler. Uh, I was very struck with the uh, media that seemed to be surrounding us, the, the, the portrayals of what I call the child man, what I've come to call the child man, uh, this half, uh, this hybrid creature, half adult, half child. Uh, you see him in uh, so many movies and uh, TV shows now. Uh, there's perpetual uh, appearance of the Judd Apatow uh, persona. Um, so those three observations came together in my mind as somehow a bearing on each other. Uh, and uh, as I started to think about it a little more deeply and to do a little more research, uh, I found that in fact something big was happening uh, according to experts. One was the emergence of what I call pre-adulthood, but what a lot of sociologists refer to as emerging adulthood. Long about the mm, late 90s, sociologists began to notice this new stage of life. That is, uh, that people were, because people were taking much longer to hit the traditional milestones of adulthood, that would be financial stability, uh, and most especially uh, marriage and childbearing, that uh, they were living a different kind of life in their 20s uh, and even into their 30s. Uh, than, uh, than they had in the past. 
Um, Pre-adults, um, as I call them, are uh, in this age group. Um, I'm mostly talking, I should warn you now, I'm mostly talking, well, almost entirely talking about college-educated young people. The story for those with less than a college education is rather different. If, if during the Q&A you want to bring that up, that's fine. But that's, that's actually not what the book is about. Um, most pre-adults uh, are uh, very much on a career track, and if they're not on a career track, they're going to be getting there soon, uh, and very focused on achieving in this, uh, in this economy. Um, the, other, uh, the other thing, of course, that, that uh, experts were noticing was the uh, rise of women. Uh, the uh, incredible achievement over the last 40 years of women, this is a particularly noticeable for this age group in the 20s. They, these are the young women who have been the beneficiaries of the so-called uh, girl power movement. They got to watch the Spice Girls when they were little girls and sing about girl power. Uh, they had their own little league uh, teams and their own uh, backpacks with girls rule on the back on the back of them and uh, there was a, a tremendous uh, emphasis and uh, um, kind of project that developed around the socialization of young girls to be ambitious to be uh, uh, to be smart to be aggressive uh, and it was incredibly successful uh, so those were the two. Those are the two major demographic phenomena uh, that uh, are kind of the linchpin of the book. Um, and I want to want to explain briefly why I think this has happened. I mean, feminism seems like one obvious uh, reason, and it, it, it is a, it is a big uh, reason for it. But but something more was going on uh, that's less understood, and that was the emergence of what economists often refer to as the knowledge economy. Now, the knowledge economy, like the name says or implies, requires a lot of knowledge. That is, you uh, have to, in order to make it in that labor market of the knowledge economy, you need to be able to think, to write, to communicate, to analyze, and to compute. This takes, or so we hear, years of education. Um, so the uh, percentages of people going to school uh, exploded during the last 30, 40 years. Um, in 1970, I believe it was, there were only 8% of, of Americans had a college degree. Today it's 30%. Uh, so the knowledge economy, were, oh, an even more amazing, <laughs> amazing number is that uh, the, a number, the, the percentage of people who went to graduate school just in the last 15 years has increased by 67 percent. Now, longer time in school means you're putting off adulthood by, the very, by that very fact. Uh, uh, add to that the incredible complexity of the knowledge economy. This is something that's, um, that I uh, talk about quite a bit in the first chapter of the book, and I, I, I hope that some of you will, um, all of you will read it, and, and because I think that it's right in front, one of those things that's right in front of us, but we don't quite realize the enormity of it. Uh, when I graduated from a, a small liberal arts school in 1970, most of my friends uh, went on to become one of five or six things. They either were going to be a doctor or a lawyer or a psychologist or a journalist or a professor probably one or two other things, but it was a very kind of narrow set of choices, narrow set of options. Today, it is entirely different. The uh, explosion in knowledge jobs uh, has been such that uh, people like myself, who are parents of, of kids who are entering that economy, are really at a loss of how to advise them, uh, because not only are there so many of those jobs, but a lot of them are very mysterious. Let me just give you a couple of examples so that you know what I mean. So today, here's, here are some jobs that didn't even exist uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Web designer, video game developer, diversity administrator, content strategist. I don't know what that is, but I hear it's a job out there. Environmental consultant. Um, there was the explosion of what, I, what a lot of economists call the design economy. 
Uh, the design economy, which was a, very much a function of globalization and improved technology, uh, meant that more and more stuff had to be designed and had to uh, be planned and packaged and, and put together as, as consumer uh, goods became uh, cheaper uh, as a result of the rise of the uh, global economy. Those uh, goods had to have a lot of um, a lot of knowledge economy laborers thinking about them. As I said, designed, packaged, planned, strategized, uh, and so on. So, oh, not to mention capitalized and uh, regulated. So. All of those jobs uh, were, were um, um, added to the options for young people today. Um, now, um, I said before that, um, yeah, that there was an increase, a big increase, in the number of young people going to college uh, over the last decades. And that is true, but it's a little misleading because actually the big increase was women going to college and not men. Uh, the, the percentage of men going to college stalled as of 1970. The percentage of women going to college continued to go up and it continues to go up to, uh, to today. Uh, by 1980, they were becoming uh, predominant in the in the colleges, uh, or at least they were they were equal. 1980. Now they are 57 percent uh, on average. Uh, there are some schools, many schools, uh, where they are 60 percent of the college population. Uh, so uh, women took to the uh, not just to school, but also to this knowledge economy. You know, the manufacturing economy that preceded the knowledge economy was um, not so friendly to women, not just because there was discrimination, but because so many of the jobs required brawn, uh, uh, heavy lifting, as, as it were. And um, that was something that men just did better than, than women. The knowledge economy uh, it, it suits women very, very well. Uh, for what, well, whether the reasons are biological or socially constructed, doesn't matter. It's, uh, it's just a fact. Uh, they are excellent at the communication skills required for fields like journalism, publishing. They dominate in those fields uh, as of this point. Uh, they are very good in the design industry as well um, and dominate there as well. So there we have just this amazing um, uh, expansion of education, this shift into the, into the knowledge economy, and this imbalance between men and women. Now that, you know, I, I uh, don't want to say there's anything wrong with women's achievement. Sometimes I'm misinterpreted as saying that. Absolutely not. What there is, what, but there is a problem when there is this imbalance. Uh, and I, oh, I should add one more fact. This is terribly important. Not only are women 57% uh, uh, of college graduates, 60% of master's degrees, and about half of all PhDs, but they are now, and I'm referring to single childless women, women just out of college, they are now out earning men in most uh, American cities. So that this, uh, you know, when we talk about pre-adulthood, and I describe how it's taking longer to, to hit the conventional milestones of adulthood, I think there's a tendency for many of us to say, well, oh, okay, so it's taking a little longer. But that, the, the um, later age of marriage, later age of adult stability, uh, combined with this uh, uh, incredible achievement of women, is historically new. It just has never, ever existed. Now, one of the main arguments I make in my book is that these uh, trends have left men in a bit of a bind. In every other society, in every other culture that human beings have ever created, men knew they had a certain role to play. They knew that as they grew up, uh, they were going to prepare themselves to become husbands and fathers. That was their central role. Now this sounds like it's more of my nonsense from you know, doing all this work on the family, but it's anthropologically true. 
Okay, you'll, have to, you'll just have to accept that at face value. So men knew that was their ex uh, extremely important social role. What's happened with the rise of women and with the rise of the knowledge economy at which women have uh, excelled and with various other uh, changes in our, at in our attitudes, cultural changes, particularly uh, having to do with women's independence, men are really uh, picking up the idea that maybe they're a little optional in, when it comes to family life. Uh, they uh, are you know, told that, um, uh, that they should be nice guys, that they should uh, treat women as equals. Uh, and women uh, are, uh, after all, often going on to have children on their own uh, and are certainly putting off marriage uh, as they need to in order to achieve in, the, in this knowledge economy uh, in a way that makes men um, uh, reconsider their role in, as, in growing up. So they often look, oh, and we should add one other, one other thing that happens. In addition to all of these trends, there's also in our culture, and this, uh, this is the sort of negative strain of feminism uh, that uh, I think we need to acknowledge, there was a kind of anti-male message going on. There was something wrong with men. They were too pushy. They were too authoritarian. Uh, they were too patriarchal. And therefore, I, I argue in the book, one thing that happened was that men, young men, looked around and thought, well, how am I supposed to behave? You know, what, do I ask a girl out for a date? Nobody does that anymore, as many of you may know. Uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, you have women saying, why don't they ask me out for a date? So there's a great deal of confusion in terms of how the relations between the sexes uh, as a result of pre-adulthood and the lack of a, of a clear script for men uh, and for women as well to a lesser extent. One of the things that uh, I argue is that the, even though women also go through pre-adulthood, they have a ticking clock in their ears and that is the ticking of the biological clock. They know they don't have forever. You know, they know that there's a limit to, uh, to their pre-adulthood uh, as I refer to, or a limit to their this period of self-exploration and of uh, career search, uh, they know that um, uh, if they're if they're paying any attention, even if they're not going to have children, or even if they're not sure if they're going to have children, the decision has to come. It has to come. They have to be thinking about this by their late twenties, early thirties. Men do not have the same pressure to grow up. I, I cannot tell you how many men who have said to me in the, uh, as I've uh, been talking about manning up, I'm a guy. I can wait till I'm 35 or 40. You know, no sweat off my back. Well, of course, women don't have that luxury. And what you find then is this kind of tension between the culture, which says, you know, have this long period to play around, to think about your career, to, exp you know, to move to... Uh, to move to Europe or Asia or, where, or wherever in order to pursue your career or just to, uh, to further develop yourself. Um, but don't, uh, you know, and don't worry about marriage. That's, that's the cultural message for young people in their 20s. But the biological message is rather different. So there is this gap between the culture uh, which encourages autonomy, encourages a delayed uh, adulthood, uh, and biology. Uh, and I think that that is part of what we're seeing in the tension between the sexes. Now, um, let, me, let me end just by, uh, end that section, but just by saying very quickly uh, what I, we are beginning to see an increase in number of single mothers among college educated women. This was not the case up until now. Most family breakdown was confined to people, uh, women without a college education and particularly those without a high school education. Now we're beginning to see it. The numbers are quite small, but it's growing. Uh, women who are becoming single mothers uh, in their 30s uh, after they've achieved their, uh, their um, a career. 
And the problem with that, um, uh, well, there are a number of problems, but one of the major ones is that I think it reinforces what I call the child man. It says to men, you are optional. You're not really needed. We can manage on our own. Now, very, very briefly, let me just tell you a little bit about the response I, I got to the book, I've been getting to the book. Um, the response really centers around the issue of blame. Um, men are telling, men have said, you're blaming men. Uh, uh, you're calling them children, you're saying they're immature because they play, uh, they play video games. Um, there's actually in the book, there's only this much, like a, a single paragraph on video games, but I cannot tell you <laughs> the messages that I've gotten from gamers. I mean, so this is a major, I hope there are none of you out there, but we can talk about it if you want. Uh, uh, the, so a lot of men felt dissed, felt blamed. Uh, I, uh, and I, I kind of understand why, because as I said before, there is this anti-male strain in the culture. And I think some people saw my book, or it, it, before they had read it, because I don't think if you read the book, this is what you get out of it. But uh, had the impression that this was another, my book was another, uh, another way of dissing guys, of saying that they were uh, no good and useless. Women, on the other hand, said I was blaming them. So um, I feel a little bit like a mother with my kids. You know, <laughs> everybody feels blamed. So uh, women said, uh, have said, well, um, you are saying that women shouldn't uh, achieve, that they should get married at 20 or 22, or everybody should, we should have some kind of mass wedding at 22, um, and uh, everybody, you know, women should go back to the kitchen. Um, so you're, then you're blaming women. Now. What I want to say very briefly about this issue of blame is this. It's, it, it has nothing to do with blame. I'm talking about enormous economic, cultural, and social shifts. These are, are you know, it's not guys being bad or women being bad, although I think we can do a lot to negotiate this new period of pre-adulthood, this new reality of the success of women, much better than we are. I'm not blaming anybody, and in fact, I think there's a great deal of, uh, um, to uh, um, celebrate about pre-adulthood. But we do uh, need to have a better sense of how to take, uh, how to understand this gap between biology and culture that I talked about before, and this uh, tension between men and women because of that gap. Thanks. Michelle Hirsch will, will comment first. Oh, 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 Eric, you want to go first? <laughs> Eric Platt will comment first. <laughs> it's a bit unusual for me to serve on a panel discussing the current crop of men and women in their 20s and early 30s. As a historian of early modern Europe, as you've already pointed out, I usually research, teach, and write about people who lived hundreds of years ago. And let's just say that they had lives that were quite a bit different from the modern 20-something um, here in the United States. But still, I'm glad to participate in a discussion of Kay's well-written, witty, and provocative book. One thing that struck me when reading Manning Up was that it was much less about 20-something men than I expected from both the title and from the selection of the book that I read in the Wall Street um, Journal um, before I actually read the book itself. Only chapters four and five, really representing around 30 pages of the, of the total text, deal exclusively with um, the species that Kay refers to frequently in her book as the child man. Chapters two and three, which together are almost twice as long as the two chapters devoted to the child man, detail the numerous successes of young women over the past couple of decades. The other chapters of Manning Up are at least as much about the women of the millennial generation as they are about the men. In chapters two and three, as she's already described, um, Kay talks about the rise of what she calls in the book, quote, the new girl order. Over the course of the 20th century, women increasingly entered the workforce. They also gained an increasingly large share of them, um, represented an increasingly large share of Americans with college degrees. Women today make up 57 or 58% of the total college graduates, 
and women between the ages of 21 and 30, as she pointed out, in cities such as New York, um, are now out earning their male counterparts. As the book puts it, quote, for the first time ever, and I do mean ever, young women are reaching their 20s with more achievements, more education, more property, and arguably more ambition than their male counterparts. Many scholars have attributed the large number of women entering the workforce during the 20th century to the introduction of the birth control pill and feminism. While acknowledging that both played a role, manning up complicates this narrative. Citing recent research by various economists, it argues that a much more important factor in the rise of the New Girl Order was the second industrial revolution that introduced new technology, such as indoor plumbing, central heat, and household appliances into the American home. I completely concur with Kay's arguments here, although I approach the topic from a slightly different perspective. I have read quite a bit of the literature of the women's position in 19th century England, when England, of course, was the first country to experience the Industrial Revolution starting in the late 18th century and expanding during the course of the 19th century. By the latter 19th century, a few of the technological breakthroughs that made household tasks easier for housewives, such as the introduction of the sewing machine and stove, had already taken place. Trust me, women of the period treasured these innovations. But as the historian Patricia Branca has pointed out, the average day for a middle class housewife was still one of tremendous physical labor. Most of these women did have a household servant. If you were middle class, you typically had one. Upper classes would have had more, of course. But as Branca puts it, quote, the amount of daily menial labor involved in keeping the middle house home was overwhelmingly and physically exhausted, exhausting for only two women. Um, in fact, if you look at the women who are going to um, doctors during the latter 19th century, their most common complaint is just sheer physical exhaustion. As the amount of work required around the house decreased during the course of the 20th century, thanks to technological innovations, women were increasingly able um, and had increasing opportunities to find work outside the home. The rise of the knowledge economy has furthered women's successes in the workforce even more. While men continue to dominate in more traditional fields, such as construction and manufacturing, which of course have been devastated by the recent um, Great Recession, both here in the United States and around the rest of the world. You know, again, um, it's been called before the, the man session. Um, women represent a slight majority in both management and professional occupations, as you point out in your book. Manning Up also correctly points out that the knowledge economy has created a large number of new jobs in government, um, and nonprofits. That's that's correct. I mean, you didn't you didn't talk about that that much, but that's definitely um, an area that you see women gravitating to, P um, positions which young women have been gravitating towards in much larger numbers than men. Um, just to give a couple statistics, women make up 52% of state employees now, 60% um, of employees in local government, and the numbers are even higher when you look at the um, female share of workers in various nonprofits. But while recent data seems to suggest that our economy is finally beginning to pull out of the horrible economic conditions of the past couple of years, knock on wood, um, there are signs that this rebound, this recovery is, as one um, newspaper article recently called it, a quote, he covery. Um, as a recent New York Times article has pointed out, Gains during this recovery have mostly been in male-dominated jobs, while the number of jobs held by women have, has actually fallen by almost 150,000 um, positions. As governments at all levels have begun to sharply cut their budgets, female-dominated jobs in government and the nonprofit sector are on the chopping block, damaging female employment even more. And I guess my question is, um, Kay, what effect do you have, if any, do you think that these cuts that are occurring and will occur in greater numbers over the course of the next few years, what, what effect will they have on the new girl order that you describe in the book? And this is slightly personal uh, because my, my wife works at a nonprofit and she actually had a couple weeks ago, they called everyone in and said, we're losing a lot of our government funding. Um, 
you, your, your ad notice, um, you know, we're going to have to make some major cuts. And so, you know, I've, I've read a couple articles that have referred to this, and at the same time, um, you know, from personal um, example, you know, she, she works in just the type of office you described, you know, largely female, um, largely women in their 20s and, and 30s. Okay. After describing the tremendous amount of success that women have found in the workforce in recent years, the book moves on to their male counterparts, whom Kay describes as children men and, quote, the funhouse mirror image of the alpha girl. I've already mentioned that this section was significantly shorter than her chapters on women millennials, and to be honest, I found it less convincing um, as well. Chapter four, um, the chapter Child Man in the Promised Land, was in my opinion the weakest in the book. With the wealth of supporting footnotes and data um, that Kay uses in preceding chapters largely absent, and solid quantitative evidence, which again, um, she builds a very good case of, about the rise of the New Girl Order um, in, in really earlier chapters in the book. That solid quantitative evidence being mostly replaced with anecdotal evidence largely drawn from Adam, Adam Sandler or Judd Apatow movies and then Maxim Magazine. The data provided by Kay and other authors on the subject show that women are doing better in school, have higher college graduation rates, and even earn more money um, in many American cities um, today. But I've got to say that I found the image that the book paints of Maxim reading video game playing, again, you, you're right that you don't talk about video game playing that much, but Maxim reading video game playing 20-somethings who idolize Adam Sandler and Seth Rogen, spend their days yucking it up over iFart, and create um, you know, websites, you know, anti-female websites to be way over the top. The anecdotal evidence could be, could be accurate. Perhaps pre-adult males really do need to man up, but I would have liked more solid data to support the argument. Besides, one could use anecdotal evidence from popular culture to argue that millennial women aren't quite as pristine as presented in the book as well. Kay argues that the only example that she could come up with of a child woman is Sarah Silverman, the comedian who was on um, Comedy Central for a while and pops up you know, a fair amount still. But I definitely argue that other figures such as Britney Spears, um, Keisha, um, Snooki, um, and her, and her uh, fellow cast members at Jersey Shore prove that there are, are many more as well. And unlike the characters in Knocked Up, Snooki is real, I think. I, 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 I'm not sure about that. Um, some of the data that I have read actually seems to complicate this image of the child man as well. I, I think, it, you know, again, women are succeeding um, in larger numbers than men. But as Jeff Arnett has pointed out in Psychology Today, the typical problems associated with young males traditionally, such as alcohol use, crimes, and unproductive sex, has actually declined significantly in the last 30 years. Um, Kay herself admits that unlike Michael Kimmel's description of this group of men in Guyland, um, he describes them as, you know, startlingly sex-obsessed homophobes who never show emotions. There is a little evidence that men are more obsessed with sex than any other generation, and polls show few signs of homophobia um, within this group. On the contrary, millennials, men and women alike, favor gay rights by large margins, and, of course, the notion that 20-something men are obsessed with sex isn't exactly a new phenomenon, which you, you point out in your, in, your, in, your, in your book. I'd like to make one final comment, which is really a question, and that is the last chapter emphasizes the danger of extended childhood in couples waiting until their late 20s and early 30s to marry. I'll grant that the average marrying age of around 28 for men and 26 for women is later than it has been throughout history, although you could find exceptions. You know, the upper class man in the Italian Renaissance didn't get married until his you know, mid-30s. But do you believe that the rise in age of first marriage is really such a negative development? After all, you acknowledge that 80%, 86% of college-educated women and 84% of college-educated edu men marry by the age of 40. Most of, most, of course, are going to be marrying long before that milestone. While fertility begins to drop um, among women in the early 30s, most women will be able to conceive for many years after they reach that age. You also acknowledge that divorce rates fall and the stability of marriage increases um, the older a couple is when they first get married. 
I think what we can all agree that both of those trends, you know, having stable marriages, having fewer divorces, are positive developments both for the married, married couple and for the children um, that they might hope to have. I guess my question is, is it perhaps time to acknowledge demographic changes within the educated class in America, changes that you admit are not going away and are not necessarily negative in all aspects, and help 20-something men and women write a new script about the transition to adulthood? Hi, good evening. Can you hear me? Yep, okay. So um, I'm Dr. Hirsch, and uh, as a former director of the Women's Studies Center here at St. Francis, and my research focuses on health psychology, I was really interested to read Kay's book to learn a little bit more about how the gender divide is portrayed here. And particularly, I was interested, um, as Fred commented, about um, men's health and what implications for this ha might have on men's health. Um, and so I'm going to start with a story. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to pull um, just one thing out of the book that made me think of this story. Let me just get to the right page. Um, so it's the chapter on love in a time of Darwinism. It kind of looks at this phenomenon from a Darwinian view. And I'm just going to read one sentence from the book. Jillian Strauss describes a 34-year-old sales manager from Dallas who says his current girlfriend meets only six out of his ten requirements for the perfect girlfriend. When they go out together, he is constantly looking for, quote, an upgrade. So one of, one of several gender differences that we know exists, and it made me think of a story that I tell in um, my, one of my courses that I teach. I teach a human sexuality course. Uh, and the story is called The Coolidge Effect. Um, and I'm hoping that it will make for some lively discussion after uh, we're through with the panel. But it goes like this. One day, President and Mrs. Coolidge were visiting a government farm. Soon after their arrival, they were taken off on separate tours. When Mrs. Coolidge passed the chicken pens, she paused to ask the man in charge if the rooster copulated more than once each day. Dozens of times was the reply. <coughs> Please tell that to the president, Mrs. Coolidge requested. When the president passed the pens and was told about the rooster, he asked, same hen every time? Oh no, Mr. President, a different one each time. The president nodded slowly and then said, tell that to Mrs. Coolidge. <laughs> I brought the story to the panel to bring up because my question, and, and Kay raised it, is, she brought up the idea that uh, men today don't have a life script. And I'd like to reconceptualize that as maybe it's not that they don't have one, it's that they've rejected it. These are different times, culture is different, and I think they're looking for something different. And now I'm going to take us back to Carl Jung, uh, an early psychologist. Uh, he was around from 1856 to 1939. He was an analytical psychologist, and one of his major contributions to psychology were uh, something called archetypes. And archetypes are defined as primordial structural elements of the human psyche. They are things that we know exist. Uh, there are all kinds of stories around them. And the one I'm going to pull out for the discussion today is something called PUR. And uh, it's bipolar. It's described as being bipolar. And it's got both a positive and a negative aspect. The positive side of it is what we see as a traditional man's role, something that symbolizes newness, um, potential for growth, hope for the future. Uh, he also foreshadows the hero that he sometimes becomes. And in our mind, for traditional relationships, that becomes the husband and father. Um, there's also a negative side or a shadow side to this archetype which is the child man who refuses to grow up and meet the challenges of life face on, waiting instead for his ship to come in and solve all his problems. And it's been also reconceptualized as the Peter Pan syndrome. I don't know if you've heard of that. Um, and, and these ideas have been around for quite some time, but I think Kay raises them to a level and she uses uh, some pop psychology or uh, pop culture 
as a vehicle to really portray the, the changes that we're seeing that this has become more common. Um, another observation I had was social networking, and she talks about it a bit in the book, but I know from working with students, uh, and again, we're living in, in New York, in Brooklyn, one of the places where the young hipsters go to after they've gotten their degrees and they're looking for jobs and careers. Um, but I've heard stories about Facebook, hookups on Facebook. Uh, life is very different, and there's a, a level of distrust that probably perhaps has never existed before or has never been communicated so openly distrust before. Distrust between who and who? Between men and women. Uh, looking for relationships, but not exactly knowing how to go about obtaining one or making one work for the long, long haul. Um, and so I hear stories about students who get up at 2 and 3 in the morning to check their Facebook page, or better yet, to spy on other people that are potential love interests to see what's on their wall or who's been communicating with them. Um, and they're losing sleep over this. Um, and it's, it's a completely different way of conceptualizing relationships that never existed before as well. I'm going to turn to health. Um, and I am always interested in how, as a psychologist, how uh, culture, how politics, and uh, the way that people interact affect health. And for a long time, uh, health psychology is fairly new. It's only been around as a, an area of study for maybe, I don't know, a handful of decades. Um, one of the first things that we learned in health psychology in terms of gender differences was that men died about 10 years earlier than women married in marriages. Uh, and that as women then started advancing career-wise, uh, that gap closed down a little bit. So I'm just wondering, and we can open this up for discussion, have men or younger men now come to know that there are some aspects of marriage or working hard that minimize their life, changes their life in such a way that now science even says this has an impact on your health. One other interesting thing I'm going to add is that, um, and this is recent research, um, there was a major study released last year. It concluded that single people who have never been married have better health than those who have married and then divorced. So there are health implications in this. Uh, I don't know if the young men that Kay, are talk Kay is talking about uh, are thinking about this or if it's become part of our culture in ways. Um, but I know that there are discussions that uh, people can have kind of anonymously online with strangers where they can pour their hearts out and say, I'm in this kind of relationship, what do I do? Uh, and there's always the comebacks of, you know, leave her, you can't trust her, or leave him, you can't trust him. Um, different, all different topics that are being discussed that I know at least when I was a little bit younger or certainly in my parents' age, these things were never even available to them before. There were things that just weren't discussed. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that. And, uh, Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Kate, you want to respond? Uh, I have a few, <clears throat> a few things to say. One is, thank you for Snooky. You're so right. <laughs> perfect. She's <laughs> perfect, and you're absolutely right. I think also um, that, particularly in their early 20s, you do see, uh, there was Snooky College educated. I somehow don't see that. Nevertheless, I, I take your point. Um, I do think that uh, young women in their twenties, uh, early twenties, are sometimes uh, sometimes look a whole lot like the child man uh, image that I've that I've uh, uh, described. So I, I take your point there, and I think, um, like as I as I mentioned during my my talk. Women do have this um, this limit. You know, they, they know that this can't go on uh, in a way that uh, that men uh, do not. Um, the uh, let me, let me say something about Michelle's point about the distrust between men and women. Um, this is this is something that I noted quite a bit 
uh, in the course of my research. Let me just give you an interesting example. There's a uh, website called OkCupid. Okay Some of you may know it. It's a, it's a dating website, um, uh, internet dating website. So, um, the guy, so some of the people who are involved with this website have been keeping a lot of data on who contacts who, uh, what, what, they, uh, what they're looking for. They, they, it's very, very interesting. But one of the points that they make is that everybody lies. Right? Men lie, uh, you know, you should, I think they said something like um, you should take about two inches off their height and women, you should take off about 10 pounds, add about 10 pounds. Um, it could be, it could be as well. That's true too. And their income, by the way. Uh, men men uh, often lie about that. So insofar as people no longer have an opportunity to meet, uh, uh, well, they might meet in college and then, and then come together later, or uh, they, they might not. They might find themselves in a very anonymous city uh, not really meeting many people. They go to the internet, and uh, most people do it. And by the way, a lot of, a lot of uh, success for people in the, on, the inter on the internet uh, dating sites. Uh, I, I'm sure all of you here have heard good, uh, good stories about that. But there is this other side, which is that there is, a, there is this mistrust that's set up right away because you know you can't, you can't be sure this person is telling you the truth. Uh, and in pro in, in, uh, probably he's, he's not. Uh, in addition, I would add to that that um, with the breakdown of the script, um, what happens for uh, m men, a lot of the men that I've spoken to and that I read, whose, whose work that I read, is that they, um, you know, uh, they've been told, treat, women are your equals, treat them with respect, uh, we're going to have a gender neutral workplace or gender neutral society even and they uh, a lot of these guys say okay okay that you know I, I can do that I'm gonna be a nice guy um, and what they find is that once it gets to dating and mating once it gets to intimate life it's not so simple that women often don't seem to like the nice guys this is one of the most common complaints on uh, dating websites and on men's websites. It's the lament of the nice guy who says, you know, they, they always go after the jerks. Why, why is that? Uh, and, um, you know, I think, you know, again, this is this kind of um, tension between culture, uh, which is telling us one thing, and biology is sort of sneaks, you know, sneaks through and knocks on people's heads and, you know, and, and makes it so that it doesn't quite conform to our ideals. And that takes me to Eric's point about uh, later marriage. I, I, I um, absolutely agree and make the point uh, in the book that uh, we don't want early, you know, this is not a plea for earlier marriage. I think that uh, uh, the data is pretty clear. If you wait till 25, you are in much better shape for uh, having uh, a, a healthy and long-lived marriage. Um, there, I think it does take longer to grow up uh, in this very complicated economy, not just because you're not settled down, but just because all the emotions and psycholo psychological tensions that go along with looking for, with, with, with uh, finding your, your way in this economy, uh, have to get worked out before you before you uh, know whether somebody's going to be a good match. So I to I completely agree with it, and I think I make that point. But there is this problem, uh, which is that uh, we have uh, a, a lot a, a lot of women who for whom this is not working. Um, I don't have numbers on this because it's very we we do know that the. Um, uh, infertility rates have gone up quite a bit. Uh, we know from the use of, of uh, reproductive technologies, which are incredibly expensive and probably not very good for your health, that, uh, that a, a lot of women uh, are not finding this transition so easy. Uh, and all of you in this room must know women who are incredibly talented, uh, successful, uh, competent, um, can't find anybody.
you know, in their they're in their mid 30s or mid uh, or, or even older. So this this is happening, uh, and it is leading to what uh, what we call the choice mother. Numbers, as I said, are very small at this point, but they are going up. Yeah, like 47,000, right? Or single single mothers who are college educated having their first child. Um, in 2005, that's the Emily Bass. But that was what, uh, I'll have to look up yeah. that. I, that's not the number that I have. But at any rate, yeah. it is going up, uh, and, and it has to go up. 57% of our college graduates are female. We, women are either going to marry down, and I kind of doubt that's going to happen in large numbers, maybe in some, uh, or they are going to not have children, not marry, or they're going to go on their own. That's just mathematical truth. So. But still 86% of women are college educated women are getting married. That's in the previous, you know, in the cohort so far. Yeah. yeah. But that, that can't, as long as we have more and more women, if, if it goes up to 60%, which it looks like it's going to, in terms of uh, male, uh, female graduates, you know, it's numerically impossible for that to continue. I just want to make a few comments and then uh, a few questions, and then I'll turn it over to you for questions. Um, the value of a college degree is much diminished. The <laughs> 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 value of a college degree is much diminished. <laughs> uh, you already have, you, you, you know. Uh, President McIroy, Chancellor McIroy likes to talk about, talk about some colleges as sleepaway camps. And that's what they are. They're essentially wonderful four years social event where you don't really do much reading and don't really don't do much of anything else. Uh, so I'm not sure how that will play out in terms of marriage. In other words, marrying down may not carry the same connotation when the degree itself doesn't carry much weight. Uh, a question for Michelle. How does the health of married and unmarried men compare? Not whether they're once married, but currently married. People of the same age. Compare a 60-year-old man uh, married and a 60-year-old man unmarried. How does their health compare? Got a complicated answer. It depends. Uh, it depends on the quality of the marriage. So uh, what we know is that uh, happily married couples are healthier. Couples who are in a relationship where there is a lot of discord are not so healthy. Um, so it depends on the state of that marriage, wh whether that male will stay healthy or not. And Eric, uh, I was a little puzzled what you said about, about public sector and private sector. Since 80% of the jobs lost in this recession have been in the private sector, and only recently, basically the public sector has been held harmless until the last cycle. So I wasn't quite sure what you were trying to say. Yeah. The, um well, it, it, there's recent articles talking about how the fact that since the economic recovery has begun, you're seeing um, the men's jobs, men, men's jobs are returning. What um, recovery? Um, well, you see unemployment decreasing. Yeah, but, um, but you Eric, know, it's, now it's down to what, 8.7, 8.8? Eight eight eight. Excuse me. Unemployment decreased because participation in the labor force decreased even faster. You've seen jobs, in, I mean, I'm, I'm, no, we no, don't need to debate yeah, about it. No, no, it's important. Don't go there. Because, because... <laughs> The, the, we, don't have, we don't have an increase in job creation. We have an increase in people dropping out of the economy. We've seen jobs increase by about 500,000, I think, in the, um, in the last year. And Not a as a percentage of the labor. The labor force participation rate is the lowest in 25 years. The other problem with that argument is that if I look at the kind of jobs that are being created, they tend to be low wage. What we're producing right now in America are very wealthy, well-to-do upper middle class people and a, a large People, large population working in the service industries at very at very low wages. So I just be I just be careful. The nonprofits are a whole other matter, and whether they're good for the economy or not is 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 quite questionable. Let me go on to one other thing, and then and then I I want to want to ask Kay a question, and then I want to open it up to you. Kay, do you think the Great Recession will have an effect on attitudes? In other words, if people if if as I, I think is correct, we're going to muddle for the next five or six years. Isn't this bound to, to shorten the, the, the time of slackerdom? Um, first of all, I, you know, I don't know, I don't know how many guys out there are really slackers in the sense that, that in the Judd Apatel sense, I don't know that that's really that common. What I think has been true, though, is that the, the knowledge economy, which I've described before, 
uh, it, it, there's a lot of churning that goes on. People, do, people take a lot of different kinds of jobs uh, in, the, in their 20s uh, and move between careers. They, they move between states. They move between jobs. They move between countries. Uh, and um, a lot of that has to do, uh, some of it is just really following a particular career path. But some of it is also um, self-exploration, you know, trying to figure out who am I. You know, one, one of the things, that, one of the points I make in my first chapter is that it's not just that um, uh, there, there are all these very uh, interesting jobs out there, but that this generation has, and I'm talking about the privileged uh, group of, of this generation, has been raised to think of work as, as really expressing themselves. Uh, you will hear the word passion, oddly enough, used over and over again in relation to work, far more in relation to, uh, in relation to relationships. Um, so that, I think, is going to have to ease up. I think that there's going to have to be a lot more common sense and um, hard knocks uh, you know, that, that you bring to the uh, job search. and. Uh, lower expectations about just how, how gratifying work can be. In terms of evolution, um, my understanding is that uh, the, the hope of the female, or, the, or rather the way things were designed, was the male, the, the, uh, the female um, if you was jump looking in on these for the free. best provider, the, the guy who could uh, reliably provide for her and her offspring. Um, and that sometimes led to a situation where certain very powerful men, if we're looking at humans, had all the women, you know. Uh, and that's why in polygamous societies, um, one, of the, one of the reasons that they're uh, inherently unstable is because uh, certain wealthy men can have a number of wives, and it means that the less wealthy men have, have none. Uh, now, my reading of the, the situation is this, that when we saw the rise of the bourgeois family, the middle class family, in the 18th, well, late 17th, 18th century, that became, that, that family was a very child-centric family. And it uh, also uh, was based on affection between the, between the couple. I, you know, no more arranged marriages. Uh, there was more of an expectation of companionship, of affection uh, between, uh, uh, between the couple. Uh, but the child-centeredness of that arrangement, I believe, had a great deal to do with the Industrial Revolution, with the, with the advances that we began to see in the uh, 18th, 19th century. Um, and I think uh, what, what we now know uh, from the research of how children do in single parent families versus married couple families, that bourgeois family, that middle class family, still seems to work in terms of creating children who are going to be the most successful in this economy. Uh, one of the problems, and this gets to my other, my other work, uh, not so much uh, manning up, but one of the problems, uh, when we saw the breakdown of marriage in the uh, 60s and 70s and 80s and on into now, uh, among lower income folks, that coincided with the rise of the knowledge economy. And what that means is that you had more and more single parents who were not able to prepare their kids for this very complicated economy. If you look at the way uh, uh, middle class parents are bringing up their kids now, I mean, you've all seen the jokes about helicopter parents and uh, soccer parents and this and that. That is a response, I believe, to the knowledge economy because it just takes a tremendous amount of, of nurturing and uh, fussing and trying to figure out where your talents lie and trying to figure out uh, how to get your best, um, the best training. Uh, in order to really have successful children. So um, I don't know if that, that begins to answer your question, but that's Either, 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 can, I'll, oh, I'll, I'll comment about the behavior part of it, and uh, this is just m my speculation, and I thought about it while I was reading the book about, uh, Julie asked if, uh, is it that these behaviors are new behaviors or this that we never really took note of them before? 
uh, in terms of, I guess, the male behaviors is what you're alluding to? Well, the whole emergent adulthood pattern. Has it always been there? I mean, that's part of the emergent adulthood literature. Has it always been there? Is it really a new phase in development? I think it's, it goes back to what Kay said about the script, the life script. Um, and this is just a different way to conceptualize the life script. I, I, I was talking to Eric beforehand about uh, having this romanticized uh, image of like the 1950s, 1960s husband and wife, but it's probably not so romantic of the wife making the dinner, serving the husband when he came home, putting his slippers on for him. He would slip into his smoking robe and uh, after dinner go retire to the library and have a drink or talk to his friends. Who knows what, what that discussion was about behind doors because women weren't welcome. Uh, and the women were together taking care of children. Um, and I do know, like, it's not discussed, but the rate of alcoholism in women at that time was very high. They, they might not have been so happy. And perhaps the men were retiring and having their drinks together and who knows what they were talking about because they were breaking out of that life script for a little while. It was a man, a man time, or in today's uh, language, we've got the man cave, where <laughs> men go and they convert their garages or their basement to their, their, uh, their fantasy life, so to speak. So I think the behaviors have been there. I think they're just exhibited more openly um, and acknowledged more now. It's not a majority of women taking those positions. It's, no. it's the mid women fill the majority, you know, like 52, 60% of, of state local offices. It's, it's not as if the majority of women are going into those, yeah, into those right. offices. Yeah. We'll we'll speak to the first part, Kate. Yeah. The part about abortion is really interesting. Uh, it is interesting. Um, and there's no question that it's played a role in the rise of women. I mean, that women have been able to control their fertility in whatever way, whether, whether through through contraception or abortion. However, uh, it's uh, interesting to keep in mind that the abortion rates uh, among educated women are, are far, far lower uh, than they are among less educated women, um, and, uh, and uh, particularly among minorities. So uh, it's, I don't know how much abortion is, the, is how big a role it's playing today uh, in the lives of, it, it's playing a role. It's just not as, uh, as profound as you might think. Uh, I, if you're asking, are there women who become pregnant and then, and then decide not to get an abortion and have the child, yeah. Uh, I'm just thinking of an example that's from popular culture of the, of the uh, uh, Sex in the City, the Miranda, remember? Look, my book is pretty uh, observational and, and uh, not, not prescriptive, um, but you know, I, I, and, I, and I'm going to leave you with a, not a very specific uh, set of ideas. Well, one, one specific idea. One thing we've got to do is figure out what's getting in the way of boys' achievement, educational achievement. That has got to be a major focus of, uh, uh, of the society as a whole. Um, the gap between men and women, the, uh, the graduation gap that we, we've talked about is, is a, it, I think, is a, will turn into an increasingly major problem uh, as these numbers go higher. Um, so that's number one. Number two is, is a little vague. Um, but I think that there's a lot of ideology and a lot of um, uh, mis- um, a lot of self-delusion that goes on in the mating scene now about what people want. And um, I hope that the book can start a better conversation, um, even among, even in, you know, interior conversations about uh, what about the nice guys? <laughs> are, are we really, you know, are women really ignoring the nice guys? I don't know. They'll say no. Uh, but I suspect some of this is true. Um, are men um, uh, assuming that they don't have to um, be, you know, I'm looking for the right word, not gentlemen, but, you know, you know is, is, that the, is that really what women want? And, and um, you know, some of this stuff has to be uh, talked about more, more Can, widely. Yeah. The, where, where does the notion of hookups, which evidently is replaced dating on campus, where does that fit into all this? Well, um, you know, the, the hookup is, is, is a real phenomenon. It's maybe a little bit uh, exaggerated in the media um, in that, uh, you know, if you look at the data, most, you know, maybe, maybe a majority of kids have had a, hook, a hookup, but it's not the only thing they're doing. In fact, they're 
are many, many close relationships that develop in college. Um, however, uh, the um, sort of expectation of casual sex, I think, uh, is, a, is a problem in the 20s for those women who don't, you know, really would like to have more serious relationships. Uh, and they often feel uh, that they are so outnumbered by women who are willing to have casual sex that they don't really have a choice if, they, if there's a guy that they like. So, you know, and this is a, a, a point that's been made by an, in an interesting book called Premarital Sex in America that you might want to look at um, that says this there's a demographic problem here once men, uh, you know, once you have uh, no opportunity, no, women ha who say no to sex have no power at all. What, what role does um, starter marriages play? Yeah. I mean, that was something that was talked about quite yeah. a bit a few years ago. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was surprised to see that they're still pretty common, I think. Um, the uh, starter marriages, um, that, that's a term that was developed by a, a, a young New York Times writer named Pamela Paul. She wrote a book about her own starter marriage, what it was. She married in her early 20s. Uh, the marriage only lasted a couple of years. There were no children. They, hadn't, they didn't have children. Uh, she and her husband split up. Uh, they and both went on several years later to have marriages which appear to be lasting and in which there are children. So she coined this term starter marriage and you know I, I, I uh, find I would guess that there will be fewer of those the more we take for granted that marriage is going to be later um, but occasionally you, you hear about them. What age, what age is that? So like 26 to a woman oh, is 28. Oh years. well you know um, as I said before, there's a lot of there's a lot of research to suggest that if uh, that couples that wait till they're 25, or at least the men and women who wait till they're 25, are, are going to be in better shape in terms of having a long-lasting marriage. I think it's probably already swinging. I um, mean, I think the uh, you know the, the, as this generation of empowered young women have come of age, uh, I think they themselves are looking around and saying, well. Maybe the workplace isn't all it was cracked up to be. Um, maybe, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, they reached their late 20s, as I've said, and um, think, well, you know, there's got to there's be more to my life than, than just the workplace. So uh, I think there's that. And I think that there's eno there are enough voices out there um, that uh, speaking up for men uh, right now that I, I do think it's, go it's going to be changed. Now, it hasn't yet. and. Uh, there's, there's, there's a little bit of work being done on male uh, underachievement in school, more than a little, significant amount. It's becoming a recognized problem, so. But Kay, ex yeah. excuse me, uh, a nation of, at risk was 25 years ago. All the school reforms of the past yeah. 30 years have had zero effect. Yeah. Why is this going to have any effect? I don't know. I mean, no, it may not. Fair no, enough. I'm saying, well, well, the only thing, the point I would make is that the, the problem, the male problem has been pin, pinpointed, you know, so whether we can figure out what the, how to, how to address it is another question, I don't know. Sure. Uh, I, have, I have just a simple, uh, simple comment in response to your question, and it goes back to when Kay was just talking about hookups. Um, I think one of the, the backlashes of the feminist movement I mean, it's great that women are advancing. Uh, they're, they're finding all about all new things about themselves. But I think it also produces a lot of confusion in younger women about what their role is in relationships. Um, it used to be clearly defined, as Kay said, about the man would ask the woman out, he would pay. There's a whole section in the book about the man paying versus not paying on a first date and what that means. And even today, the statistics say that on a first date, the majority of women still expect their male date to pay. Um, and so there's got to be confusion around sex that most people still don't feel comfortable communicating openly about, especially with a new partner, about what you do and what you don't do. And so is a hookup going to happen or is a relationship going to happen? Um, and I think that because of the feminist movement, women probably are somewhat confused about what their role is and how much they say in relationships. I don't know if we'll see the pendulum come back anytime soon, but my response to that is I think another issue, and, and uh, maybe Kay can talk about this as well, is 
In our country, we have a huge issue with not being able to communicate very well. Individuals aren't As taught... As opposed to what country? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but I'm talking about here, what I'm familiar with. Um, but, but we don't know how to communicate. Most of us aren't raised with good communication skills. Uh, we, we might or might not have had parents that communicated openly with us. And there, there are communication differences between men and women. Um, if I had all the money in the world, I would love to start in schools with young children communication skills training. I think it would produce a whole generation of people that would learn to raise their children differently, um, and it would be different. Are you shaking your head because it wouldn't Michelle, work? Michelle, <laughs> we, we spent the last 35 years in, in secondary education talking about just these things, and the, and the effect is we graduate kids who don't know what a grand jury is. You know, you should, you should go for the PhD, but you should, also, <laughs> you should also be smart about your love life, you know, even when you're in your 20s. Um, a, lot of, a lot of women assume that they have a lot of time. Um, you can do both. I mean, you can do both. You may not be able to get to quite the heights that you want. The truth is, once the babies come, things change. But, but you know, you can, you can do it both. But I, but I do think women need to be smart about, about their dating life. I think that there's a tendency to sort of be attracted to the child man or the bad boy or the, you know, don't waste your time. The, the question was what, what can be done to, it, to bring this age group into the churches. And it's an interesting question because one of the, one of the facts of pre-adulthood is it's very mobile. As I, I've said several times, there's a lot of moving going on. You know, you're not stable in one place. This detaches you, tends to detach people from their communities, from their civic institutions, and they don't vote very much, just, just to give you a, another example. So uh, I don't know, I, you know again, I, I don't feel like I'm in a position to really advise you on that, but just to understand the, the problem is that this is, um, so this is a fact of the, of the knowledge economy. First of all, let me thank everyone uh, for being here. And since Kay mentioned the word vote, I want to tell you that in the fall, we're very likely to have a panel just like this on the millennials. It's not definitely, there's a new book coming out on how millennials vote. Are they really the dumbest generation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we can debate that. And, uh, and, th and th hopefully we're going to have that come uh, next October. Uh, before I let you go, I just want to thank uh, uh, Chancellor Macchiarola for making all this possible.